You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Louisa Tregan. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. We've got a great show lined up for you today. Be sure to go to HankGarner.com and subscribe to the show. No matter how you listen, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Pandora, Spotify, or YouTube, you can subscribe to the show and never miss an episode. I'd like to thank some sponsors today. Scribophile is a respectful online writing workshop and writer's community. Writers of all skill levels join to improve each other's work with thoughtful critiques and by sharing their writing experiences. We're the writing group to join if you want to find beta readers, get the best feedback around, learn how to get published, and be a part of the friendliest and most successful writing workshop online. Improve your writing by receiving detailed critiques. Learn from a vast collection of free writing resources. Make lifelong friends in our busy community of writers. Writing is a solitary art, but that doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Lucky for you, there are thousands of writers on Scribophile every day, and we're a really friendly bunch. You've never seen a writing group like this one. Join Scribophile today at Scribophile.community. For the Words is a unique writing motivator unlike anything I've seen. For the Words is an online writing platform which motivates writers of all backgrounds to increase their word count through gamification. Writing can be challenging, especially when you need to consistently produce a high output of words. By injecting a little fun into the routine and using daily rewards to promote a healthy writing habit, For the Words makes it easier to reach that word count. We're a community of bloggers, professional authors, college and high school students, research scientists, gamers, and first-time writers from all over the world. Come for the words, stay for the fun. Go to 4, that's the number 4, thewords.com. Both Sides of the Law, the Casper Halliday NYPD series, book 1 by Nathan Roden. He shared his father's dream of becoming a detective. A prison sentence was not part of his plan. Casper Halliday's dream began to unravel two months before his 16th birthday. His father, Bobby, resigned from the NYPD after 15 years without an explanation. Casper's parents fought. Sirens closed in on their home from every direction. The sound that had always been a source of comfort now brought only humiliation. Bobby Halliday moved out. Casper's dream dissolved into a daily fight for survival. All he wanted now was to finish high school so he could ease his mother's burden. On his 17th birthday, in the throes of depression, Casper made a bad decision. That decision brought him face to face with one of the most dangerous men in the city. In Casper's world, there is laughter and there are tears. There's light and there's bitter darkness. There are improbable friends and unspeakable enemies. The Casper Halliday NYPD series launches with the most unlikely of beginnings. Read both sides of the law today. The ebook edition includes a sneak peek of Ghost Man, book two in the series. Writers, the internet is one of the best tools for research and creativity. It can also be one of the biggest hindrances to productivity, distracting you from doing the seat in the chair, hand on keyboard work. Rescue Time gives you an accurate picture of how you spend your time to help you become more productive every single day. Spot inefficiencies in your day and become better at managing your time. Create a goal like spending less than one hour per day on email to help you stay focused. Set an alarm to tell you when you spent more than two hours on Facebook. Try Rescue Time and use our special discount code for 30% off a Rescue Time premium account by going to rescuetime.com slash author stories. Let us help you rescue your time. The Sam Darling Cozy Set of Six, a box set of the Sam Darling Mystery Series. You can't beat the deal on this huge box set of six complete cozy mystery books, 800 pages all in one for a low, low price. 
Follow Samantha Darling, her dog Clancy, and her beloved George through the first six books in Geraldine Dufresne's best-selling cozy mystery series. Between her big family of five siblings, her charming hometown of Quincy, and a sudden run of murders, Sam has her own work cut out for her. No one asked her to investigate, but that has never stopped her before. Includes book number one, Who Killed My Boss? Number two, Any Meat in That Soup? Number three, Can You Picture This? Number four, Will You Marry Me? Number five, Where Is Henderson? And number six, Who's the Rogue? Read the entire series with a new one coming out this fall. The Sam Darling Mystery Series by Geraldine Dufresne. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Louisa Traeger on the show with me today. She has a phenomenal new book. It's called The Dragon Lady, and you guys are going to love this book. Uh, welcome to the show, Louisa. Thank you, Hank. Thrilled to be here. I'm excited to have you. Uh, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Well, I have always scribbled in diaries and made up plays and, you know, written short stories. So so I think it, it's quite hard to, to answer. As soon as I could read, I knew, you know, that's what I wanted to do. And as soon as I could hold a pen, I was writing. I love it. Um, did uh, did anyone else in your life uh, recognize that this the storytelling thing that you had going on? My mum always bought me a shed load of books, um, for which I'm always grateful. Uh, she, she was quite ill as a child, and she always felt like she had never had enough to read, so she overcompensated. And I think, you know, in the most wonderful way, I think that lit the spark. Yeah. It, it's so, so interesting how... Um just the the act of absorbing books tends to breed that uh in in people like the more you read the, then the more you want to tell your own stories uh, i think that's right and and you know i'm still an obsessive reader yeah um what what were some stories or authors or series that really captured your imagination when you were younger i could talk for about an hour about this I mean, the Dr. Seuss books I always loved because of his completely zany imagination. Um, Enid Blyton, who is frowned on now, but boy, she was an addictive storyteller. Um, what else? The Curious George books. I don't know if you had those in the oh, States. Yeah. Those were amazing. Yeah. When uh, Do you recall when... Uh, when storytelling became something you were really interested in, uh, other than just the, the random scribblings, when, when, when stories kind of started taking form in your mind, uh, kind of out of whole cloth? Well, my route to storytelling was very circuitous. Uh, I got... Those are the best. <laughs> I, I trained as a classical musician, and I actually now think that maybe that was a writer's block, a very long writer's block, um, because at the time, words, uh, sorry, music seemed like an easier form of expression because it was nonverbal, although music brings its own challenges. And it wasn't until I was in my 20s, got sick and I had to take a year out from music that I suddenly woke up and thought, hey, I'm on the wrong track and, you know, I want to write. But I think that desire had always been in me. Yeah. Did did you did you feel like you had um, kind of innate musical talent? Was it something that came easy to you? Weirdly, it was easier than writing. Yeah. I see that that's uh, you know, there's this really interesting uh, cross section that seems to happen between artistic expressions. Um, you know, people rarely just write. Uh, there are there are other things that we're interested in and other expressions that that and maybe it's not for forever or for a lifetime. But you know, creative people tend to dabble uh, in in I different things. I think you're absolutely right. I've seen that so many times that if somebody is creative or, you know, wants to be expressive, it spills over, you know, into many forms. Uh, but I, I think that I love music. I'll always love music 
but writing is really my thing. Sure, sure. Do you feel like your time as a musician uh, has informed uh, the way you write, maybe the way you connect with stories? Um, have you ever thought about how one might inform the other or maybe things that you learned, tools you picked up along the way that help you as a writer, as strange as that sounds? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. Um, and I think music informed my writing in all sorts of ways, not least giving me the discipline to glue my butt to a chair and sit on my own for hours honing my craft my craft and you know what one can sort of smile at that but but actually that's key is just to to sit there and work at something till it comes right but as well there's a whole host of parallels between music and language like rhythm and tone and pace um the ability to blend many voices or to make one voice stand out that there, there are a whole host of similarities I uh, I have these little sticky notes that uh, stick to the edge of my monitor and uh, and they kind of, sticky notes <laughs> and and they go around there and, and when I uh, when I glean something amazing from an interview I'll jot it down things I don't want to forget and I have one right in the center uh, at the bottom of my monitor and it says uh, it, it's ten percent talent and ninety percent putting your butt in the chair. Oh, and, uh Absolutely, I so agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> That's you cannot uh, you cannot overlook the the place of discipline and just learning to show up and do the work. I totally agree. Another quote I love is that good writing is rewriting. Yes. And so true. You know, when you read a book and you really admire how the prose flows and it seems so smooth and seamless, it probably took about a hundred drafts to get it like that. Exactly. It's a lot of work to make it look so easy. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> now, somewhere along the way, you uh, you gathered a PhD in English. Uh, yeah. What yes. was what was the the thought behind that and the motivation to pursue uh, that formal English education? Well, because I trained as a musician, I never went to college. Well, I went to music college, but that, that was different. That was like a performing school. So I felt like I hadn't finished my education and I wanted to go back and do that. I decided it would, you know, all happened at the same time that I gave up music and, and switched to, you know, literature. Um, and, and I think that was, I mean, I, I gained so much from it because, you know, the study of of literature is the study of people. Um, and I, I think it was part of my training as a writer as well. And my PhD uh, thesis actually gave me the subject for my debut novel. Wonderful. I, I love that you say that, that the study of literature is the study of people, um, because we talk about that on the show a lot, the, the idea that no matter what genre – uh, we're writing in. We're all telling stories about the human condition, and the, uh, the the window dressing of genre may be different. We may be telling a fantasy story, or a science fiction, or a thriller, or a romance story, or a uh, you know whatever. We're, we're telling stories of the human condition, even though we dress them up differently. Totally agree. It's all, it's all about you know human nature. Right. Well, after music and, and you started pursuing this, this literature uh, degree, did you feel like that you had found your place? Did it did it resonate with you that this is where I'm supposed to be? Um, I felt like I was moving in the right direction. I was getting there, but I felt like I wasn't an academic. And it's when I started writing fiction that I really thought, you know, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Right. So you said that your your thesis uh, brought you to your first novel. Um, that, the, that's the, right. The Lodger is your first novel. Tell us about that, and and what was it about that thesis that led you there? Um, well, my thesis was about a writer called Dorothy Richardson, um, who was an innovator of modernism. She was like another Virginia Woolf, but she got forgotten by history. And she was a total boundary breaker in her life and in her writing. She couldn't conform to any of the very limited roles that were available to women at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, 
but she smashed just about every boundary and taboo going. She earned her living independently. Um, she was bisexual at a time when that was illegal. And she wrote Stream of Consciousness before James Joyce or Virginia Woolf. Um, and at the same time, her writing is quite dense because it's just sort of pure stream of consciousness. So I thought, wow, this is such a fascinating woman and someone should tell her story. The world should know about her. But I did it in traditional prose, not in stream of consciousness, because I wanted to make, you know, her accessible. That, that's a that's a great point. Um, it, it's like being uh, the difference in being. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, purposeful in in taking the story to a certain place instead of just. Uh, I, I guess you could have studied her to the point and then just let it flow out, but uh, but the narrative is 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 driving to a purpose. It seems. Yeah. Like. Yes, and I I think now, you know, everybody's got short attention spans, and you know. Writing with a purpose is maybe more important now than it was when Dorothy started writing, which was in 1914. Do you know what I mean? The world was slow, and what she was doing was very new, very experimental. So it, when it came out, it was sort of new and wonderful, but then she kept on writing the same thing, and, and the world lost interest in her. What? Did, where did you start digging for information to to bring Dorothy alive? I found her totally by accident. I was um, I was I wanted to write about Virginia Woolf. I was mad about Virginia Woolf, and I was looking in the college library um, for an angle on Virginia Woolf that hadn't been written before, and I wasn't having much success because there've been you know so many books written about Virginia Woolf. And um, I stumbled on a review Virginia had written about Dorothy Richardson. And that, that was my starting point. And then, you know, researching is like being a detective. I love it because you follow all these angles. You know, I discovered there'd been one biography written about her. And I, you know, found out where her letters were. And um, it's totally like being a detective because... Some avenues are dead ends and others open up into the most amazing possibilities. Exactly. Um, one thing that I love about, uh, uh, about your books is the, uh, the immersion. Um, the, uh, you write historical fiction, which are fictionalized tales of, of, of things that really happened or, you know, uh, world events and the events surrounding these people. Um, how much fun is it to take something um, that that we know existed and then put your own uh, best guess on the details of that? How, how do you, and especially when you have a subject that's that's so revered and, and something that you care care so much about, um, is it difficult to to get in and and try to fit the pieces together and find the space between the pieces? Well, I'll tell you how I look at it. Um, the historical information is like a skeleton on which to hang the story. And then when the fiction comes in, it's the license to imagine you know, yourself into the character's thoughts and feelings. And um, for example, while I was researching the dragon lady, a family member gave me access to her letters which really made her voice come alive for me and then I was able you know I felt I was able to create my own image of her within the sort of biographical outline and I love that extra license that fiction gives one sure sure um when you when well first off um you the idea for this came um, from your thesis, uh, when did you start working on the novel in earnest and, and realize the story that you wanted to tell? Oh, so we're talking about two books at the same time. The, the Lodger, my debut, came Yes, my thesis. Was, was that it? Yeah, yeah, The Lodger. Yeah, we're, we're okay. going to get to the new book in just a okay, minute. Sure. Okay, so I did my thesis and I gave birth to twins 
And I used to use when when the babies were um, sick, had colds and blocked noses and needed their cots to be propped up so they could breathe a bit easier. I used to plant a fat volume of my feces under each leg of their cots and think, well, at least I'm using my feces for something. <laughs> <laughs> and and having twins is pretty full on. So there were several years when I didn't, you know, write. And if I was out of my pajamas by lunchtime, it was a major achievement. Um, but I think during that time, I was thinking and thinking, well, Dorothy, you know, is such a great, fascinating character, and someone should tell her story. And I, uh, when my kids, you know, went to kindergarten and I had a bit more time, that's when I started writing. So it was slow. It was a slow burn. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that book became the Lodger and now your new book, The Dragon Lady. Um, after after writing a book that you felt such a personal connection to um, and, and, and finishing that project, getting it out to the world, and then you're back with a clean slate um how how did this story of the dragon lady come to you it came with a question from a friend have you seen zimbabwe's secret monet the painting was allegedly hidden in the vaults of the national gallery of zimbabwe to keep it safe from robert mugabe who was then president I've got family in Southern Africa, and on a trip to Harare, I managed to access a few of the secret paintings, and I found out that they were donated to the gallery by Sir Stephen Courtauld and his wife, Virginia. And my curiosity was really piqued by this secret stash of art, you know, in Zimbabwe. Um, and I started to research Stephen and Virginia and very quickly became hooked particularly on her and, you know, decided I needed to write about her. What was it about Virginia that, that uh, sparked? Well, it was the tattoo. She had a, a snake tattooed on her leg. It went right from her ankle all the way up her thigh and only her husband knew where it ended. Um, and this was at the beginning of the 20th century when tattoos were most often found on circus performers and sailors. And I just thought this woman must be such a rule breaker, you know, to, to have had such a huge tattoo. You would stop and look at it twice now, but then it must have been quite startling. Oh, I would imagine. Uh, and <laughs> so isn't it? F it no, go ahead. Her rebelliousness, you know, her refusal to live by the rules, really, that, that captured my imagination. Did uh, did the, the creative process for this book go similarly to the previous book, or did this take a life of its own? Um, this one took a life of its own, and partly because there was much less biographical information available, so... There was more fictionalizing. And I think maybe with The Lodger, it was my first book. And I was writing about Dorothy's affair with H.G. Wells. And I was sort of, you know, these are real people and he's a famous author. And I, I felt a bit constrained. But somehow with The Dragon Lady, I felt the training wheels were off. And I just had a wonderful time writing it. Well, um, how did you decide what to or how how strictly to stick to what you could find out about these people. So where the facts were there, I, I stuck to them. Um, and that, that was mostly in the sections set in Europe and in England. Um, in the Rhodesian, it was then Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe sections, um, there was much less biographical information available. So I, I had you know, a basis. They did a lot of, they fought for racial equality. Um, and that got them into trouble, you know, led to threats and all sorts, uh, sorts of trouble with their white neighbours. So I sort of had that fact, those facts, and then I, I embe embellished them with my own story. Did the, did the tattoo um, open doors for you to, to connect with her character? Um, I, I guess what I'm asking, because you you did get this feeling of this rebellious nature. Um, did that open doors to ex explore social things that um, 
that you could then draw conclusions, you know, b- because she's a rule breaker here, this would probably lead to. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And I think that um, she was a rule breaker, but she also really wanted to be accepted. You know, I, I felt that from, from her letters. And it was that, that contradiction also appealed to me. Yes. Contradictions always appeal. We, we, yeah. I think we, because we're full of contradictions. Exactly. And, yeah. And it's, it's fun to watch how, how other people wrestle with those things. Yes. Yes. And I mean, so Virginia, um, she married, she was half Italian, half Transylvanian, and she claimed to be a descendant of Vlad the Impaler. She married. She married a very wealthy Englishman. And, you know, you can sort of just imagine her at these polite dinner parties in England in the 1930s, this tattooed, divorced foreigner just saying whatever popped into her head. You you can imagine the eyebrows were raised. Well, this was um, this was at a time uh, when England was was dealing with uh, a with that type of situation and divorce and kind of scandal at the highest levels, yeah. um, was that something, uh, was that fun to kind of play off of? That, that was so fun. So you're referring to, um, Edward the eighth who abdicated because he wanted to marry Wallace Simpson. And I put Wallace into my book because there were all these parallels between Wallace and Virginia. They were both divorced foreigners who sort of got where they were through huge personal magnetism and great style. Um, And also, you know, before Wallace came along, uh, people really frowned on divorcees in England. Then when um, the Prince of Wales started to go around with Wallace Simpson, attitudes to divorce softened. But then when he became king and abdicated to marry her, there was another backlash against divorcees. So that that sort of movement must have affected Virginia. So I, I you know, I made the most of that. For sure. Um, the the book is very evocative of a place. Um, how do you uh, how do you, when you're researching a place so that we feel connected to that and, and the the story becomes immersive, what sorts of details do you look for um, so that you can use just enough to make us feel a part without just going full, um, uh, you know, describing every detail? The, the, every detail is not needed. It's the ones that, that stick with you and make you feel a part. How do you, how do you? decide those so part of the answer to your question is having a great editor which i did have with my publisher (laughs) Um, but um having said that i my mother was south african um and i have a sort of very passionate love hate relationship with southern africa um and the way it you know, the, the very sort of high sky and the, that the harsh sunlight and the vegetation and the smells, um, that's something I'm quite passionate about and always wanted to write about. So, you know, that those sections were just a pleasure to write. Right. Um, what what about the, the people? And you said you have a love-hate relationship with, um, yes. uh, with, with Southern Africa and the... the um, the landscape is something you're passionate about. What, what about the the culture and looking for those things to highlight and the things that to, to choose to talk about? Well, I spent time as a child with my grandparents in Durban, and this was during apartheid. I was a young child, and you know, children have a very strong sense of justice. I think, and I could see things happening that were wrong. I knew they were so wrong, but I didn't have the maturity to really understand the situation till later. Um, And there's a a girl called Catherine in my novel who, um, well, I put her there to really show how extraordinary the Courtauld's were, you know, when they arrived in Rhodesia. But when I finished writing, I realized that there was a bit of me in Catherine. 
So, you know, I guess part of the Southern African situation is my story. And um, you know, my mother's story, she she left as soon as she could because she couldn't right. deal with it. Wow. Um, tell us about Sir Stephen. Um, how does he come into the story? Okay, well, he is Virginia's um, second husband, and he is a really um, fascinating man. So um, he was a, a First World War hero. Um, he was a historian and a voracious reader, a highly you know, educated man. He was a keen mountaineer. Um, and he was deeply philanthropic. So he, he was a pretty fascinating character in his own right. But he was a very, very reserved man. So he was the opposite of Virginia, who was so fiery and so flamboyant. So it was a real ma marriage of opposites. But at the same time, I think they completely adored each other. And it was a true love match. And, and this book is such a great blend of uh, historical fiction, adventure, um, a great character study, um, a, a fantastic romance in there. It, when, when people are finished with the book, uh, when they close that back cover, what do you hope they're left with? Well, just a sense of this extraordinary couple, really, these extraordinary people who um, were really ahead of their time um, and did, you, you know, were agents of change. Um, and also, I guess I'd like them, you know, to take away sort of the vividness of Africa. What, what do you think, um, uh, the Dragon Lady, how, how do you think this could affect the way we feel and, and see the world around us today? Well, I mean, I think there are a lot of parallels between, you know, the situation in Rhodesia in the 1950s and sort of the current political situation. Um, and I guess, you know, it's about the importance of not swimming with the crowd, um, but having the, the courage to sort of stand by your convictions, which, you know, is a very has always been a very difficult but necessary thing to do. Well, the book is called The Dragon Lady. It's uh, it's out everywhere now um, in hardback and Kindle edition and audio book. Um, Louisa, this is such a fantastic book. We're going to send everybody to pick up a copy of it. Um, is If people are just learning about you, is there a place where they can connect with you online and read more about you? I have a website, um, louisatrager.com, and I'm on Twitter, Instagram, and I've got a Facebook page. So, yes, I'm all over the place. <laughs> Excellent. We'll link all those in the uh, show notes of this episode. Uh, Louisa, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show well, today. Thank you, Hank. It was a total pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in to the Author Stories Podcast. Be sure to subscribe at hankgarner.com or on your favorite podcasting app. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. What in the name of Carl Sagan was he doing in the cemetery on Halloween? What was he thinking? He whirled, expecting the headless horseman himself to be waiting on the road ahead. Or was he lurking behind? He wanted to run, but now the bridge ahead worried him. Doesn't the horseman haunt bridges? Could he avoid crossing it somehow? It terrified him. Why? It was just a stupid bridge. The gloom beneath could have been the lair of a troll. Billy Goat's Gruff. Mama used to read that. The troll waits beneath for the fattest, sweetest goat. Jason thought he saw something on the far end of the bridge. A shape of some sort. He stepped onto the bridge and gripped the knotty railing. He felt the ground drop away beneath as he edged forward. His eyes remained on the shape. It's nothing. It's nothing. Is it nothing? No troll attacked him as he reached the other shore. The looming shape was only a stupid stairwell opposite the bridge that climbed up the hill and into the main cemetery. He turned left and ran, admitting defeat and letting the fear take him over. He ran southward down the long, dark road. His initial burst of adrenaline ran its course and he slowed, then walked again, limping a little. Headstones slipped past on the right. He still had enough light that he caught his reflection occasionally in the polished stone. 
He looked very young and very thin. He could feel his vulnerability as he walked along. He grew aware of his own body, the touch of his starchy dress shirt and his jacket and the soft weight of his backpack. He saw himself reflected in the headstones, just a container of warm fluids, flimsy work for a blade or a hoof or a sword. He felt shatterable and transient, and his next breath was not guaranteed, oh no. The leaves made a faint oceanic rustle all around. The insects sang their three-note songs. Jason Crane, Jason Crane, Jason Crane. Jason sang a wretched pop song as he walked, something about having no self-control and no bitches and not enough money. He sang it softly, absent-mindedly, as if reciting a psalm. He passed Reese, Finnerton, Bane, Ekdal, Forest, Black, Small. There. He saw the gate at the end of the road. But the gate would be locked, he remembered. He would have to climb the embankment and cross over the churchyard. He could see the spire of the church above and the weather vane spinning against the sky. He would rather climb this gate than face that churchyard, but the spikes on top made leaping the fence impossible. Okay, just be quick. Something caught his ear, a brittle, clipping sound. He scanned the crest above and saw a horse silhouetted among the graves. It looked to be tied to a branch of the locust tree. He had heard its hooves as it shifted from foot to foot. It rustled somehow. His breath caught. He forced himself to be calm and rational. Some Halloween thing, maybe, for some event. He found the stairs and ascended, sideways, ready to bolt if necessary. He watched the horse, but when he neared the top he saw the rider, standing upon the shallow depression of the horseman's grave. The figure was motionless, a dim shape that absorbed light and gave nothing back. He could make out the shape of the boots and the legs and two arms held away from the body, palms down. Just a man? But the cape of the thing was not normal. It contorted painfully, twisting in the air even though the wind wasn't blowing. It wrung itself and billowed and whipped slowly, as if the figure wore a wave torn from a black ocean. And above its shoulders, is he headless? Is he headless? Is he headless? 